Okay, so this one has kind of a flat base. All right, so I'll do that first. No particular reason. might be saying wait now couldn't you have used some of that length to uh, set up some platforms for long flakes yeah I'm not taking it all back just yet I can send in some flakes but I don't want to send too many flakes in this way uh, because it starts to put the curve back in what I really want to do is send in flakes on this side <clears throat> okay but I'm going to look to see if there's lumpy spots first. Uh, take care of those and then go back to thinning. Uh, <clears throat> thinning uh, so that it creates the convexity. Is this, remember this was the very difficult side. Uh, <clears throat> the convex side of the bottle is the easy side. The other side is the hard one. <clears throat> Okay, there's just a little lumpy here, uh, lumpy spot or a mass here I want to get rid of on, in this area. <clears throat> there are various ways I can do that. <clears throat> I can wait till the notching, because it has notches on the side, or these are corner notches. I can wait until that stage, or I can do it now. Or do it now and mess up and then have to do it later. Yeah, let's see. Does copper grip really well on glass? Better than steel and better than anything? I think yes, it does probably grip better than anything. still has to be abraded though and I don't use aluminum very much or I'm not using aluminum very much right now except for the indirect percussion uh, be mainly because I've got my aluminum pressure flakers stashed away and the other reason is they wear down faster than the copper I don't like maintaining the tools all that much Although I could do that aesthetically as well. I could sit here and I could make sure my tools are pretty looking throughout the whole stage, whole uh, process. Okay, so a series of three flakes to get rid of some of that. And I'm going to go back to uh, contouring this to make it more convex. convex in the sense of the long ways not convex in this sense because since it's already convex in that sense but convex in this direction because <clears throat> the, the danger is always there of accidentally putting back the curve this is, this is how to avoid putting the curve back in I think that's what I'll title this particular segment uh, Preventing the curve from re-emerging, I don't know, something like that. Not a perfect series of flakes, but good enough.
Now am I kind of making fun of the guys who nap aesthetically the whole way through making sure not only the tool is dressed and the flakes are nice but their posture and their attitude when describing or demonstrating is also rather polished and contrived yeah I think I probably do make fun of those guys this is supposed to be fun right supposed to be a hobby with uh, serious implications as to how the human mind works but it still it still doesn't have to be serious the whole way nothing says it has to be uh, demonstrated like a surgical procedure right right okay so let's see I do need it a little bit thinner to fit on the typical or what I consider a typical at lateral dart foreshaft one thing I will make fun of is people that call the entire dart the or call the dart and that lateral right I shot in that lateral at the target and it missed using it as an ascent using it in a sentence know that the dart is not the at lateral the at lateral is the firing device it's the uh, it's the thing with the handle and the hook on it that you use to shoot the at lateral dart the at lateral is not the is not the dart <clears throat> so I'm Every time I, I say something about an atlatl dart foreshaft, uh, I have to say the whole thing, atlatl dart foreshaft. And atlatl dart point. I don't say an atlatl point, uh, that kind of thing. I do make fun of them. Well, I don't really make fun of them, but I probably should. That way they won't do that anymore, hopefully. <laughs> Not that it'll stop them, right? But at least I'll feel like maybe I'm doing something to improve the terminology. Nice little thinning flake. I did those kind of aggressively, which you can do them with passive pressure too and all that stuff. Anyway, let's see. Those two might make a difference. Yep. All I needed was two, two flakes, and the the, the rest of the uh, finishing out will thin it down a little bit more. But that just guarantees that I'm within range. All right. I probably, yeah, I'm going to use indirect percussion for thinning it. Right now. I'll take care of that, and then pressure flake the overall shape and the notches okay and then I'm going to use aluminum it's probably better to use a grinding stone this is a, a, a grinding wheel right piece of a grinding wheel this is a huge one like I guess that's an inch and a half across or more a friend of mine gave me a piece that was very flat to begin with about a month ago or two months ago but that's what these are these are grinding wheel fragments anyway I think it's better to use a grinding wheel to, to address the tools because you get embedded glass and flint in the tip and when you use a file uh, you, you put chips you chip the, the metal in the file if you've got stone in embedded Right, so it dulls the file. Anyway, this is this will take care of those rock chips. Theoretically, anyway. 
don't want to say for sure because I don't know for sure. I'm kind of guessing on that, but that's what I that's why I do it. I don't want to dull my file. I don't want to spend more on these tools than I have to. Okay. And, and indirect percussion allows you to do stuff like that. I love flakes like that. And glass will cooperate. It really does cooperate. Because there's usually no, no concrete, no weird inconsistencies in the material. Uh, slightly flexible, believe it or not. Uh, these brittle materials can be slightly flexible. Uh, bottle glass is made so that it doesn't break, right? Well, of course it breaks. It's made so that it has a resistance to breakage. And that resistance to breakage helps us to uh, abuse the material, for lack of a better word, to get long flakes. We really have to apply a lot of force. There is quite a bit of shock, especially with indirect percussion. It, it limits the shock in a way uh, because it's fast. It's like pulling a tablecloth out from underneath the place setting and not moving anything. It's a fast uh, sort of way to remove flakes that shocks a piece less, but it does still shock the piece. in many cases so it's good to have a material that can stand up to the abuse if there is a strike that is a little bit dicey that it's not quite fast enough or too aggressive you won't break your pe your workpiece because believe it or not I don't always flake properly. Even with my favorite technique. I'm just cleaning up the surface now with wider flakes and seeing where I can eliminate both a high spot and a chattery spot. Or Let's see, what is the other word I came up with? I don't know. Shattery. Chattery and shattery. Trying to get rid of some of those areas while I'm making it flatter and thinner. Now there's a problem spot here. On the real artifacts and stuff, they don't worry too much about these little bumps. But for the video, I'm going to try to create a very smooth surface if I can because those are annoying they can cause anxiety too right if you're trying to get rid of anxiety with this hobby and you end up finding out that step fractures give you anxiety you have to have strategies that will help you to get rid of them so I'm going to push off on the flat face of that step fracture again See if I can eliminate some of that mass just by attacking that step fracture head on. Yeah, I might not be able to. I'll use a thinner, harder steel. Let's see if that works. It sounded like it was doing something, but I don't think it was. Uh, let's see. How about a thinner, more chisel-like tip? I mean, just thinner. It's already chisel-like. 
trying to get right to the base of that step fracture so I can grip as much of it as possible. Now I think I've already smoothed smoothed it out too much. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to get the tool in there. Maybe on this side. I'm just going to work all the way around that little lump and see if there's a step fracture I can push off of. If not, oh well. well there's something in there. Just to help it uh, to smooth down a little bit before I actually drive a flake into that area. Okay. I'll set up a good striking platform. In my case, I like to do a continuous platform, so. I'll take back more than just that one spot on the edge. Okay. Still a little bit dicey. I'm, I'm not quite low enough, but I don't want to lose width, right? I'm not quite low enough to attack that lump, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'll try to take a shallow... <clears throat> the object is to take a shallow flake that will still do the job so I don't end up gouging too much out of the surface. Uh, with a low platform like this or a platform that's too high, gouging too much off the surface raises this edge too much. You know, I want to try to maintain the edge in the center. By hitting a high platform, you're actually raising the edge more than you should. But I'm going to do it anyway, just because I don't see a, an easier way to do this. And there it is. Okay, so I don't see any other nasty areas that bug me anyway. Some of you are probably bugged by this little bitty areas of chatter on the surface here, but that, those don't bug me that much. Okay. <clears throat> what bugs me is thick spots. So I need to take down a few more thick spots with indirect percussion and then <clears throat> finish up. Okay. Nice wide flake. <coughs> See, it was right here. Now, when I, I've done Cody points before, right? Eden's and Scott's Bluffs and that sort of thing. This is the kind of flaking that you need to achieve. A big wide flake. You space them out, right? Uh, there's a sequence that's been shown. I forget the name of the site, but anyway, at least on that site, they would space out these wide flakes that only go halfway. And then once they get that pass done, they come and they shoot flakes in between those. So you've got to space them out far enough apart so that you have a ridge in between each wide flake, kind of like what I have here. And so you'll, you'll be able to achieve <clears throat> what looks like a tighter flake pattern, but you're not really striking close together with each strike. You're spacing them apart on the first pass, second pass goes in between each one of those. Uh, that's why I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> the, the method is more methodical. Uh, and I, I, I do need to probably demonstrate some of those methods <coughs> so I will in the future and uh, 
I started doing research on resins. I'm going to change the topic here. I started doing research on resins. <clears throat> and I, I was reminded, I knew this before, but I was reminded that there is not much evidence on resins in the archaeological record. Uh, most of the evidence is uh, for pine pitch and asphaltum and various saps, right? Like uh, mesquite sap is one I can think of. Uh, but that's it. There's very little information on resins in the archaeological record because they don't last. <clears throat> uh, one thing I do have to remind everybody, uh, you know, occasionally is that the Native Americans did not have beeswax, <coughs> so they didn't mix beeswax with their resins, not like they did in Europe. So if you if you come across someone who says they're making an authentic Native American resin or arrowhead glue and it contains beeswax, <clears throat> they haven't done their research. Okay. Or they just don't care. I didn't mean to leave that silent spot there for dramatic effect. I just don't want to break this right now. <clears throat> so, uh, if I don't talk, it allows my subconscious less interference so it can do stuff like that. Take off a nice big uh, clearing, quote-unquote clearing flake off the surface to give me a nice flat surface. Again, I gotta make sure I don't put the curve back in. Okay. I lost quite a bit of width though, right? The length is good, but I won't be able to get the same width. Okay. But that's alright. I don't, I don't care. Now all I got to do is make sure I don't crush the edges and don't break off the tip or something. And don't put in step fractures where they weren't before. This is where a domed pad comes in handy, so I don't, uh, so I don't bridge it and snap it. It's, 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 it's not really, really thin, but it's fairly thin. I think I can get away with not a braiding on every single flake removal. Just a little bit of scratching back and forth to strengthen the edge and popping off a passive flake here and there, sometimes an aggressive one. If there's a lot of mass, sometimes I do aggressive flakes. Or if the platform is kind of slipping a little bit. And if I'm pushing on it and it's slipping a little bit, sometimes I'll just do an aggressive flake and hope for the best.
probably not the best technique, but it's for me expedient is more fun than safe. Even if it breaks more often. You don't survive in flint napping unless you are highly tolerant of breaks. I don't get all bent out of shape on brakes anymore. To be completely honest, I do sometimes, it depends on the mood, right? I hate those moods. Sometimes you're just not in the mood for anything to be breaking. And when it does, boy, that's it for the day. No more napping. Or you go on a napping binge just to make up for it. One, I do one or the other. Sometimes I'll break something and go, well, you know what? I just need to go on a binge and make a bunch of completed points and get that break out of my mind. Or I'll say, that's enough for today. Come back tomorrow and have a very vague memory of that break. Hopefully, anyway. That's another, another thing about reviewing videos. If the video has a break in the in the video, like if I break something, it's a good learning opportunity. But I gotta watch the I gotta watch my uh, my break for the second time or even a third time. It can get on your nerves. But that's not that's not bothering me too much lately either. Okay, let's see. I shouldn't do this until the last step. But There's a, there was a little step fracture in there. I think I got it. Ah. Let's see, what did I do? So I lost the length for one. What did I do? There's something weird there. Anyway, if I think too much about what's going to happen, guess what? It happens. <laughs> Funny how that works, huh? All right. I think tip breaks are very difficult to control with with glass. Not because I just did it, but because in general uh, in general because glass allows you to push flakes off easily you get accustomed to it you get spoiled and then you think you can just drive anything you want 
and then all of a sudden, boop, a little flaw will raise its ugly head and it'll cause the uh, tip to pop off or a little flaw in your technique. Uh, there's also a risk of putting back the curve uh, when reworking the tip too, so I gotta watch out for that. And I switched to this new tool. It's not new, but I switched to the different tool right when I was working on the tip. That can also throw you off a little bit, or throw it throws me off a little bit. thinking that I don't have to worry too much about putting a lot of pressure on the tip with a small tool but you do have to worry about that see I, I almost put the curve back in Re reworking that tip I still got to take a couple of flakes off of this top side here so it doesn't look like it's curving that way. I'll finish up on the next segment. Okay. Now when I first started napping glass like this, the original surface would be uh, something I would hate to have left on the, the point. That would get me most upset. If the, some of the original surface was still on the point somewhere, that just got me upset to no end. When I first started napping bottle bottoms and that kind of thing. Now it doesn't really bother me too much. Of course, depending on who I'm making these for, if I'm making them for myself, I don't really care too much. If I'm making it for a video, most people want to see how to make a point without any of the original surface. Uh, the reason why I bring that up is because a lot of guys will break their points trying to eliminate the original surface just on that particular aspect. They'll strain and stress and maneuver and design their strategy around removing the original surface at all costs and it usually if that's the attitude, 
usually ends up in the cost of the whole point. It'll break. Uh, a lot of times it, it'll break, not in half, but it'll break if, with an overshot because you're trying to force the flake too hard across the surface or something similar. Um, all I can say is the the sooner you can live with that, the easier it'll be to do completed points. And then once you have a bunch of completed points under your belt, then you can start refining. I think it's always better to have completed points under your belt, even though they may not be perfect. Just complete some points, just so you can get it finished all the way through. Get a bunch finished all the way through and then refine the techniques instead of trying to refine the techniques with every point even though you haven't made very many make some cruddy ones first and then uh, refine your technique later okay You probably can't see what I'm doing, both because of the distance from the camera and the color of the material. Right now, it's hard for me to nap this close. Uh, for one, uh, the flakes will fly up, right? But that's not really the that's not really the main issue. The main issue is. Uh, looking in the viewfinder and looking at this workpiece back and forth it's easier if it's further away kind of easier and the focus a little bit of a uh, if the closer it is the more disruption in the focus with movement further it is away there's not much disruption in the focus with the type of movement that I'm doing but if I get it real up close, I've got to pay extremely close attention to the focus. Because any, any movement is going to make it look blurry at this closeness. I'm sure you didn't want to know that. You don't want, you don't want an explanation in camera techniques. You, want to exp you just want to see what the flint napping is. But this is what I'm doing more than just flint napping. I'm also doing camera work. You realize that, right? This is flint napping or glass napping and camera work. No matter what I do, this is not really going to be how they did it back in the day because I got to make adjustments for the camera. Right? Hmm. Anyway, oh, now it's supposed to be a passive flake. Get rid of some of those uh, chattery steps. That little pocket of chattery steps right there that I could probably pick out with another tool. But instead, I'm trying to pressure flake it out from a long distance away. Yep, yep, yep. 
I tell you, I'm, I'm fumbling it, fumbling through this whole process until it gets done. Alrighty. Let's do some corner notches. About time I get to the corner notching. And yes, I'm going to lose some width. On the base, uh, I'll try to minim. I'll try to minimize it. Trying, you know, work doing all that work to try to preserve the base width, and then I take some of it off. Yeah. Chances are you'll lose some of it anyway. If you come up a little higher to do a side notch and leave all the width on the base. But chances are you'll lose a, an ear anyway. Hey man, don't jinx me like that. <laughs> now we'll never be able to do it. <laughs> I imagine there was a lot of superstitions around flint napping back in the day. You couldn't do certain things or you wouldn't be able to make a point correctly or at all. Yeah, if you don't do fasting and meditation before flint napping, forget it, right? It might have been one of the strategies back in the day. Skip a meal before you do the flint napping. Make sure you get a good night's sleep. Make sure you're wide awake. Of course, with our modern diets, fasting is something that everybody hates because we're so addicted to the energy rush of the carbohydrates well I'm off of carbohydrates entirely and I can tell you that fasting is much easier and more effective and actually yields results if you're not on the carbohydrates the brain clears up focus improves Energy level is a slightly lower, of course, but you're sitting, I mean, you're doing a low energy activity. So that doesn't matter too much. Anyway, superstitions around flint napping. I can't think of any modern ones, right? Except for um, except for certain groups of people favoring certain tool types, and I don't I won't mention who they are. You mean tool types? Are you implying that certain tool types are used superstitiously? Yes, I am. Like what? Like what? What is it? What's your source? Explanation, please. Well, it's just going to be a conjecture, right? Because we don't know for sure. But, um... Uh... 
certain tool types like you have to use buffalo horn or you have to use buffalo bone or you have to use deer bone or deer antler or you have to use it from a certain portion of the antler uh, that kind of thing those are superstitious to me anyway no one says that uh, I mean let's see how do, what was I gonna say you can nap with just about anything, right? It doesn't, there's no one receives any special benefit from a special type of tool. And I've napped with buffalo horn and all that kind of stuff. I have a, I have a warthog tusk also, and I've got deer bones from various areas of the deer. Got rib bones. I've napped with all kinds of stuff, alligator gar scales and all that. And it just it just boils down to getting a material that's getting a material. I just broke off that barb. Um, getting a material that's consistent as you sharpen it or. Uh, use it it's not going to change its consistency it's going to have um, a fairly good use life to it so you don't have to mess with the maintenance part maintenance can be extremely distracting like if you're using buffalo horn and you're you're constantly splitting the end or wearing it down very fast and you have to keep resharpening and blah 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 it's it's not really advantageous right well some guys will insist on using it just because of the special so-called special significance of it anyway let's see if I can finish this without breaking off something else here yeah I still get upset about some of the breaks All right. I tried to do that notch carefully and then I ended up breaking the barb by dropping it. <laughs> of all things, I didn't hit the side of that notch. I just dropped it and broke the barb off. Okay. So now I'm going to take back the whole edge so I can make it look a little better. And at the final stages, I, I, you got to make sure you don't get any crushing. Yeah, that neck is matching the diameter of the foreshaft. Yeah, little dart foreshaft. All right. So I'll just go to a spatula tool to finish up the edges. I get I got crushing at the bottom of these notches, right? Let's see. But I'm just going to live with that. Um, you can pop these out a lot nicer. I want to try to finish this up quickly. Uh, crushing at the bottom of the notch is just an expedient way to get it done. I don't know if I broke some of the tip off. Maybe I did. That last drop, it dropped right on the towel. I don't see. Anyway. Okay. This is slipping way too much. Try a steel spatula tool.
The other one was a steel spatula tool also, but it was very high grade, very strong steel. It's very hard, it's hard, like I said, yeah, and it slips off the edge instead of grabbing the edge. Steel's not the best material. Copper, a copper spatula tool might work better, right? But I just want to get this done. I don't have a copper spatula tool at the moment. I don't even know if you can see. There's really not many dark, dull areas, except down here. Probably press off some flakes to get it thinner. Then, of course, a lot of guys break it when they try to get it thinner. I'll just I'll just be conservative, you know. Uh, try not to be a bad example and, and snap it right as I'm trying to thin it at the very end. That edge looked kind of fat. Should be on a more domed area. I'm getting crushing all the way up. There we go. You can pick away those powdery, crushy areas. And I, I do recommend doing that if you want a very sharp edge. Uh, glass can produce a very sharp edge, but the, the trick is it's actually hard to do. The thing is, it's hard to do. It's hard to put a sharp edge on this very sharp material because it, it crushes so easily and why am I not using a spatula tool a spatula tool doesn't thin as well as the uh, rounded pressure flaker but I, I'm not really doing so well with the rounded pressure flaker either. I'm seeing that uh, those powdery step fracture areas. Why does a spatula tool work? Because there's less in contact with the edge. When you snap off a flake you're taking off just very little or something very shallow 
it, it doesn't really have a chance to dig into the edge or on the follow through. There's basically no no further contact with the edge after the initial snap, where a, a rounded tip has some slight follow through after the initial snap that kind of crushes the edge on the follow through. All right, I think that's good enough. Okay. Now, can I achieve that same result with a 40-ounce uh, bottle? This was a, the gallon-type bottle. I got another one the other night from a friend of mine just gave me this empty bottle I'm gonna break this one too but uh, if you can't get a hold of these big bottles the 40 ounce is definitely an alternative but you're not gonna be able to get a point of this size from the 40 ounce cutting it the way I did here <clears throat> I'm gonna save this right for the next set of videos see if I can get one a, a similar size out of a 40 ounce bottle bottle uh, Now that I've lost some off the tip, I might be able to reach that goal. We'll see. I'm going to measure this and stuff. So you guys don't want to see the measurements, you can go watch something else now. I'm going to examine this and measure it. I could do a few more pop-outs to get rid of the uh, powdery areas at the bottom of the notches just to make them look fresh. Or I can rub the whole thing with mineral oil and get rid of the powdery areas that way. The mineral oil kind of makes them makes the crushing look translucent or I don't know, what do you call it? It disguises these, these crushing areas, these crushed areas with a little bit of mineral oil. Or right, anyway. Just a little bit of info there. Okay, so. It's not ribbon flaking, it's, it's random with a mixture of bold and small flakes. Large bold flakes combined with small flakes. It, it fits on a pre, pre-made little dart four shaft. Plenty of room there. Has good proportions to it. Looks reasonable. Not nearly as large as I wanted, but I was working with the working with very tight tolerances and limits. I can probably get one that size out of a out of this one here. We'll see. And if the sides are thick enough on here on this bottle, I might do that too. Might use a side. Okay, so where are the measurements? Let's see. Just so you can get an idea of what you can do. Plan out your strategy. Just a little over two inches. It looks like we're right exactly at one inch wide. And for you arrow aficionados, can I stick this on an arrow and on that little dart? Yes, you can. I keep getting a piece of glass. It's itching me. All right. This is grains now. GN for grains. 78. 
Now if you want to know, let's see, uh, grams, five grams, it's 5.0. There's a little dot. All right, so grains again 76. Now, this is the lateral dart point, but you can use it as a arrow point. You mean a lateral dart points are only 75 grains? Yeah, some of them were. You have to remember. That you're combining it with the weight of the foreshaft. It's not. It's not uh, all by itself. The uh, point is not a system by itself. It has other components, and many uh, researchers forget that. So with the foreshaft, 182 or 180. Let's see, 180 plus 75 is like 155, well, I mean 255, something like that. So it, it starts to go up in weight it, it, when you combine these. And of course the longer the foreshaft, the more weight. Okay. So you, you can easily get the point up over 200 grains. Uh, with something this small with a large foreshaft okay it had a heavier wood this is oak right now this one here let's bring out the scale again this is Osage and uh, flint this is in grains again 334 so that's more reasonable for a tip on a, uh, a little dart, right? 300 grains. But you can put this on an arrow. You can also put that on an arrow. Uh, but just keep in mind, with back in the day, they, you know, they this these were part of a system. They weren't solitary. So. Uh, just keep that in mind, I guess. All right. That's it.